Oh, welcome to the Officio Spotlight podcast and thank you very much for listening. My guest today is Rob Johnson. Rob has huge experience, particularly in the more automotive sector. He was previously the Global Purchasing Director at Jaguar Land Rover, but he's also held roles as Executive Vice President of Purchasing and Transformation Development at Rolls-Royce and Vice President of Purchasing at Toyota. And since 2020, he's also been a guest lecturer on the subject of procurement at Nottingham Trent University. So Rob, thank you very much for, for joining us for this conversation today. As we say, you've, you've also got a huge amount of experience, particularly in the automotive sector. And it strikes me that's a really interesting industry at a point of quite dramatic inflection as you move from combustion engines to electrification. So I I think it'd be fascinating. And I imagine that change is particularly interesting when you look at it through the lens of a procurement and supply chain director. So I think it would be great if we could start there, really, and and your experience of of that change. Yeah, sure. Great. Thanks, Simon, for the introduction. And yeah, thanks for asking me along. As you've explained, I've spent most of my career, shall I say, in the automotive industry, and I can't think of a time in the industry where there has been so much stuff going on and so much change going on, both in terms of short term stuff and challenges, but also, as you mentioned and alluded to, I think we're going through in this industry an industrial revolution over the next few years. It's already underway. We know it, we've right. we said a lot of it in the press, as we just discussed. We're moving out of internal combustion engine after 120 odd years or whatever it is to electric propulsion, which means right now primarily lithium ion battery type configurations and chemistries. In the automotive industry, that is a revolution. Because if we think about it very simply, from a procurement perspective, if you did a bill of, a bill of material and yep. you said, these are the things I'm going to need in an electric vehicle, and these are the things I need in an internal combustion engine vehicle, it's a very different list in summary. I mean, I'll give you just a quick example. We don't need engine blocks, for example. We don't need cylinders. We don't need pistons, or we don't need injectors, or exhausts, or petrol tanks. Let's And, right. there's a, and the list goes on. So you get straight away that this is a very fundamental change in the way the product's designed, yep. uh, the way it's going to be made manufactured and that means not just the product the components and the systems and the way in which it's going to be ultimately marketed and distributed and sold actually i think it will change the downstream and it is changing the downstream way in which we see electric vehicles being managed so yeah if we're thinking about close to home as procurement people i think you know i could say with slight tongue-in-cheek really that i can't think of a better time to join procurement (laughs) um, with a slight tongue-in-cheek because i think the challenges there are absolutely you know huge i guess if people want to work in a challenging environment then i can't think of many more challenging than that and exciting because it means we're going to have to and many of all the car companies are, are more or less in the same boat we'll talk about some of them individually no doubt we're going to have to redesign the supply chain uh, lots of new suppliers coming in with the new products we're going to need the list yeah. is different battery cells battery modules battery management systems battery motors uh, e-drives e-transmissions all these type of new components Uh, Many of them are going to be different component makers, different suppliers. Some suppliers can transition out of what they were making into what they're going to need to make for the new type of vehicles. Some, unfortunately, may not, which creates, I think, potential risks for supply chain management. How do we manage out uh, the old supply chain and how do we manage in the new supply chains? I've used the words in some of my talks in the universities. It is an industrial revolution. Yeah. Uh, We've not seen such a change since the 1890s, and therefore, you know, it's success. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I think so, it's fascinating, and there's there's loads. I think it'd be really interesting to unpick. I guess the other thing is, I was thinking through that challenge. The automotive sector is huge. The companies you've worked for in the past are, are enormous global organisations with huge operations set up to run a particular thing i.e a combustion engine in a car at the same time now trying to set up this completely effectively different products as you said i'm I'm just really interested you know how how do you even start to plan for that because you've got to keep one running i guess while you build the other but yeah yeah, i'm interested in even the thinking behind that i mean you're absolutely right and this the kind of if you like the technical aspects of how to manage that change are what why i'm saying it's so it's going to be so challenging particularly for what we might call the legacy manufacturers that means the existing the existing You know, many of the names we know, you know, the Fords, the GMs, the Toyotas and everybody, the existing car manufacturers have got to transition out in and then into the new supply chains. The new entrants, and Tesla is the most obvious example, you know, don't have that problem. They've got other issues, which is oftentimes we can see Tesla particularly have been, you know, they're the first adopter. They're the people who are leading a lot of this technology change we know. Arguably, they've done a great job. Um, It's interesting when you look at the valuation, and therefore this is sort of an roundabout way to answer your question, is if you look at the valuation of Tesla, yeah, 
on, on the market, you know, capitalization front, then they are valued at about, I think last time I looked, they were over 800 billion, which is, by the way, about three or four times more valuable than Toyota. Wow. <laughs> so when we see that and we say, well, I, hang on a minute, Toyota are making over 10 million cars a year around the world. And Tesla made nearly about 2 million, let's say. So you can see straight away the market valuation here on A, we want to see electric propulsion and we want to see electric vehicles. Yeah. But also maybe they, the market also know the degree of difficulty that some of these legacy car manufacturers are going to have in doing what you've just said at the beginning, which is, you know, how do we manage out our supply chain successfully? Yeah. How do we run out all of these products without hitting further supply issues with some of these component factories are making components have got to finish at some point. And therefore, you know, synchronizing that yeah. with all the, the new model out, outflow is going to be quite some challenge. So I think some of that's priced into some of these differences that we're seeing. And I, I have to say, I mean, I think that some of the legacy car makers may not all be successful because I guess the other thing to know is we've got lots of other new entrants in there. It's not just about Tesla. If I mention some other electric car companies that are growing quickly, particularly in Asia, you may not have heard of them. So, right. we, you know, we think about companies like BYD, for example. I'm not sure everybody's heard about them. Neo, Xpeng, for example, Lucid. Maybe people have heard of them from the U.S., uh, VinFast from Vietnam have just launched a whole range of electric vehicles. So in other words, we've got lots of new entrants and we've got yeah. the legacy players trying to manage out with their existing suppliers. So I think you're right. The focus on how to manage that, and that's the challenge. It's also the exciting bit, I would I would argue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and by the way, this is all happening over a very, very quick timescale. So your listeners have probably read that with the European Union have, have issued an effective ban on ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles, by 2035. Yep. So yeah. that's not long away. That's only about w maybe one and a half model cycles away, yeah. if you think about it. So this has got to happen in very short order. And most of the car makers we can see, you know, they've got huge rollouts of new electric vehicle programs coming over the next three to five years. That gives us other supply issues, which is how do we get hold of all of the lithium? How do we get hold of all the nickel and the graphite and all the various other cobalts and all the other chemicals and refined minerals that we're going to need? So that's why I keep talking about revolution and the, the amount of focus on management is going to be very high at board level inside companies yeah. to see that happen effectively. I think you're right. And Rob, I mean, you picked up there on the on the raw materials. I mean, presumably the fundamental materials are different between a combustion engine car and an, an electric car. I was interested in, in that perspective, which keeps saying it, a huge change yeah. for the industry, right? But presumably yes. before you were buying a lot of materials, you're not going to need Right, but you're going to need Correct. a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> no, no, you're you're absolutely right, Simon. So if you think about a car today, you know we would be watching the price of, from a raw material perspective, the price of steel, particularly cars are yep. made of steel. We know that they're also made of aluminium. So steel and aluminium are probably the big kind of influences there. We've got others. We've got plastics, of course. We're probably going to still see plastics in electric cars in big in a big quantity. So that won't change. But we've also got nickel and copper to some extent in existing vehicles. But when we look and you look at the raw material mix of electric vehicle then suddenly lithium becomes by far and away the most valuable raw material in there and it far exceeds what we're going to be needing in the body of the car in terms of either aluminium or steel probably yeah. aluminium yeah uh, so and that means new supply chains because when we look at where lithium comes from it's from very different parts of the world and we've got to concern ourselves increasingly we can see it in the news as well about the whole both the sustainability of those supply chains in terms of you know, first of all, getting hold of the material and starting to mine and refine it in a sustainable way. Yeah. There's a huge there's a huge revolution there in the mining industry, I think, to come. But also the I would I would also point to the sort of uh, economic and social impact of what we're doing as well in the industry, which will be, you know, we can hear already issues to do with, you know, the labor conditions, the wage conditions, the whole ethical trading standards between the different parts of the supply chain, the value chain, which means that many of these developing countries which have got the mining industries in their countries, yeah. you know, we're gonna have we're gonna have to consider that means the value chain is going to have to consider, governments are going to have to consider how do we apportion the wealth and the distribution and share of the benefits of moving this industry to a new systematic technology, let's say. So yeah, it's a massive change right down to the mine, if you like, right going back to the mines. Yeah.
And Rob, when you've sat in really senior roles in these big car companies, I'm thinking about this transition. Is it by accident that a number of those car, you know, the new car manufacturers of electric vehicles you mentioned are, you know, are not based in Western Europe? They're not based in the US. Right. Is that a coincidence or? No, it isn't really, because if we think about it, you know, an electric car is arguably now becoming an electronic product yeah. increasingly, because not only has it got electric propulsion, if you think about it, it's also connect. The whole issue about its connectivity now is is like an electrical device. Effectively, a car, I've heard it described, it's like a mobile phone on wheels now because you're connected to the internet with it. Yeah, uh, That means we can automate the driving systems. So we can see, and of course, Tesla are, are one of the forefront of this. Others will follow in making driving automatic, for example, is what we can do because we can connect it. So they're becoming electronic devices, really, in yeah. the future, in my mind. And of course, the electronics industry left Europe and North America, what, 40 years or maybe more? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it isn't a surprise. It's not coincidence when we think, well, where do we need to go to get the technology? Where do we need to go to, to get the chemical technology and know-how and the electronic know-how? The answer is Asia. People in supply chain won't be surprised that we're having to look to places like Korea, like yeah. China, like Japan, like Taiwan, uh, semiconductors, if we think about that issue. Because that's where the home of the electronics industry has been for the last 30 or 40 years. Yeah. 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 And that's going to change. I think it's fair to say you're right about it being a political topic as well, because we can already see that the US government and maybe the European Union will do something similar, are already looking at how do they incentivize, you know, strong incentivization for companies, global companies to invest in this, you know, battery technology semiconductor technology in the region in inside the US so you can see huge discussions about the so-called IRA it, you know inflation relief uh, act which is really yeah. quite designed to stimulate green investment in in North America but that potentially is kicking off what we can see in the newspapers which is almost like a trade war between yeah. between the big power blocks about can we attract the uh, overseas investment that we need we need to be competitive in the future so yeah there's a big stake here because it's a big economic activity in in most countries as we know Rob I guess also I mean particularly automotive industry known because there's the big big names at the top but then they will be sustaining lots of jobs lots of industries underneath them kind of interested in your perspective on on that particularly from the procurement's perspective right how yeah it's a good question Simon because it's funny even if you think about a relatively small car maker like my old company Jaguar Land Rover you know they would be spending some Somewhere in the region of 15 to 20 billion pounds a year with suppliers. Yeah. Which is, you know, so when you think about the figures for people like Toyota or Volkswagen, they're going to be even, you know, multiples of that. A company like Jaguar, yeah, yeah. that's a big sum of money. You're right about from procurement perspective, we as buyers have to think very carefully about that because it has a big economic impact yeah. in the towns and cities and countries and regions where we're placing that business. So we have to have a very sensible approach to the way which we source, you know, switching things out from one supplier to the other takes time technically, but also it has a big impact on the suppliers that you leave it can mean that factories can, you know, can, can disappear. And so you're right. It has a massive economic impact. I saw some figures recently, which was showing that if we put car retail and car manufacturing together, you add those two together, then it is probably one of the biggest economic activities in the world you know it's it's larger than pension funds it's larger than commercial real estate so it's a big industry and it has a big impact on on economies yeah yeah i was also interested so you're you've you've held these big roles you've kind of come out now from the i guess the line roles we, we touched on the fact you're, you're you're lecturing which i'd like to come on to yeah um, I'm just thinking in terms of you, when you look back on those those roles now, I and mean, the audience for this podcast predominantly kind of procurement and supply chain professionals. Any perspectives, any learnings, any anything that distance from from those big roles has given you time to reflect on that that you think others in the profession could. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good good question. Thanks for that one. So, what I would say to people who are in procurement is, you know, uh, we've touched on it at the beginning. I think it's an an, an incredibly important topic now for businesses at the yeah. board level. I think over the years it's steadily become more so, but I think it's now. I've got there in a sense but in other words because of the business conditions that we're facing and that means you know even daily we can see pricing problems that we've got if we're in purchasing uh, procurement roles supply chain roles and the delivery issues we've hit through the pandemic and all the kind yeah. of covers there and then we add on which is what we've touched on which is the whole need to sustain for sustainability and going to ze- to net zero and i can't think of many sectors that don't have to grasp these topics in procurement by the way yeah. Purchasing becomes, I think, is not just the job that has to deal with the pricing. 
it has to deal with all of these elements. So that means it's got, in my opinion, one of the few sort of professions where you can be involved highly in high detail in commercial aspects, yeah. um, technology aspects with the engineering and R&D aspects of the product or service, and then the operational aspects. So I never got bored personally. <laughs> um, and so I would hope people in the supply chain can find themselves, you know, hopefully equally interested because I think there's a lot to go out there. And I always used to, I mean, the last thing I would say in that area is I, I will always go back to what my old boss said. He was a Shuhei Toyota who was the president of Toyota Europe at the time. And I was complaining about suppliers, actually, in, in my job as the purchasing director. And he, he looked at me rather severely and he said, he said, Rob, son, he said, you, you, get the, you get the suppliers you deserve. And what he was really saying was it, it was my job. <laughs> uh, it was my job to improve the suppliers. And I think that's the great challenge of being in purchasing, which is to get more from your suppliers and to do that in the right way. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think it's hopefully that encourages people that, you know, I think you're doing the right thing if you're in procurement. Yeah. And the other aspects of that, Rob, so we, you know, you're, you're now lecturing, as we said, in Nottingham mm -hmm. University. So one of the things we've covered in this podcast before, but I think it, it's one of the cliches a bit of our industry is that young people don't really understand what it even is, right? I mean, we, we have a bit of a brand problem. We're not very good at, you know, reflecting yeah. our, our role in the way that perhaps other services in a business might be. I guess more than anyone, you're very close to that because you're talking to young people who have presumably shown an interest in the topic. I mean, again, interested in your perspective on on that and maybe a little bit about, based on the students you're interacting with, what you, what you see for the future, because yes. are you excited about? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And you're right. I think in the past, you know, most people don't necessarily think about going into the supply chain for their career. I didn't personally. Nope. That's going back quite a few years, as you can imagine. But the point is that people go into it once they know a little bit more about it, I think is the answer. I mean, I'm encouraged because, and I, I work with a number of universities, Nottingham, Trent, you mentioned Nottingham University, Aston, and a few others. And in all cases, there are now either BA courses or in many cases, MBA courses in, if not supply chain management, then it's in operations management of which supply chain is so important. So in other words, I think the good news is people are going into it as a, at a degree level in degree disciplines yeah, and focusing on supply chain in a way that perhaps 20 years ago they didn't. So I'm encouraged because a lot of people on those programs and courses are already fairly literate in supply chain. They have already yeah. maybe not finally decided, but they're certainly persuaded to look at supply chain and in all walks of life as well, in all sectors, not just. And by the way, globally, one, one thing that hits me when I'm on some of the MBA courses is how many people are from all over the world. You know, we've got right. people coming from China, from India, from North America, from Europe, from the UK, of course. And what, what's interesting, that to me reflects the fact that supply chains are so globalized today and the yeah. need for international cooperation, the need for international sensitivity, cultural sensitivity is high. If you like traveling, that's a great job because you're going to have to go and see these suppliers, many of whom are all over the world. So, yeah, I think it's definitely changing. But you're right. If you Would you say we're, we're, we're at, as a profession, are we at the top table yet? Maybe we've got a bit more to do as individuals and as a profession. I think we're getting there. And I think yeah. some of the things we've just talked about, the transitions that are happening, are persuading most CEOs, I think, are now thinking, I better spend more time thinking about my procurement than I have done in the past. So I yeah. think that's good. that's good news if you're in procurement. I, I suppose in the last few years, the topics of supply chains are genuinely on BBC News or Sky News or NBC or whatever, right? Regularly, initially it was COVID and it's Ukraine war, or, you know, it's inflation. Are you finding that that's helped in terms of bringing our profession to people's minds more? Yeah, I think it is. And it's not just people who are studying supply chain. I think other what I've found interesting, because I mix with often other faculties and other people lecturing in other parts of, let's say, business school education, which is quite broad, as we know, is that people in other areas like marketing and strategy, human resources, all of these other disciplines, equally important, also are much more appreciative and recognize supply chain's importance. So they're looking, they're more inquisitive, let's say, and are asking more questions about what are the sort of principles, what are the challenges, what are the trends. So we're getting there, I think, and it's not by chance, I think. I think it's because what's happening in the world is now forcing companies effectively to think more about their supply chains in a, you know, how do we do it more professionally? Yeah. How do we get better results? How do we manage the risks? And how do we achieve the sustainability that we need? So it's a key role. I think, for, for the future. Rob, that seems like a great place to draw the conversation to a conclusion. Thank you so much for your time today. Fascinating to talk about the automotive industry and all the change there, but also your, you know, your new world in the new entrance to our profession. So thanks so much for your time.
It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much, Simon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give us a click on the follow button on your chosen podcast platform. We'd also love to hear your views on either future topics or indeed if you've got any thoughts on future guests that we should look to get onto the podcast. Thanks again. See you next time.